You good? Still sharing? Yeah, I think so. Okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll give it a try, folks. The technology in this technology presentation has been interesting. <laughs> So I would say, go ahead and let's start recording now and we'll act like it never happened. Okay, well, I think I already recorded, so ha ha. <laughs> <laughs> People will hear that too, unless we could edit the front, but that's fine. All right, well, actually we can, but we may not just because it's the level of perfection that you expect from GLC. That's <laughs> Right. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's move on to the gifts of virtual. We talked about one of the, well, let's look at the pictures first because they're kind of fun, right? <laughs> so how many of you have seen that weather person whose toddler like came into the green screen? No. Yeah. All of a sudden you see this baby emerging around her legs and then she finally just picks up her baby. <laughs> So, Aww. you know, the joys of technology, but I mean, I thought one of the challenges that we didn't really talk very much about and um, is the isolation that you can feel. I don't think I ever feel lonelier than when uh, worship is over and it goes off mm -hmm. Aww. or the Zoom call is over and everyone's gone. Oh. It feels really because uh, you don't have that long goodbye, this, you know, the church goodbye or whatnot. So for mm -hmm. me, that isolation, feeling really alone is uh, absolutely a challenge. Mm -hmm. It's so abrupt. Yeah. Vicar, do you mind going on to the next? We'll talk about the joys. Yeah, you. Oh. <laughs> Anyone happy that they don't have to drive to church today? Yes. Yeah. 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 But I did think about you guys that had to get there. Oh, gosh. In fact, I don't think uh, we probably would have been meeting tonight. And uh, certainly Chris wouldn't have been able to join us for the last several weeks because I don't think he would commute from Michigan to come for me. <laughs> so, I mean, I think one of the gifts is absolutely that we can stay more connected in surprising times. But I like to picture you all wrapped up, sitting on your couches, cozy, uh, on church gatherings. <laughs> so anyway. All right, so let's talk a little bit about what it means to be the body of Christ, because this is what does it mean to be a virtual body of Christ? Um, so I think it's good for us to get grounded in what it means to be the body of Christ. And in uh, the first chapter of John, it's that really famous prologue. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God. The word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Without him, not one thing came into being. And what came into being was this, the light that overcame the darkness. And then he goes into the word became flesh. So there's something about the incarnation that is pretty essential to being Christian, this body of Christ, that God could have done the work that was done in Jesus in a lot of ways. But this is the way that God chose to show up in the world. In a person, it matters. And I think that's what uh, you all were getting at with the fellowship, like feeling other people around you mm -hmm. makes a difference. <laughs> and we have dogs too. <laughs> <laughs> they usually are really quiet on Zoom calls. <coughs> Darked very much. Uh, but on John 20, you know, how does uh, all the disciples gather around that first night? Jesus comes walking into their midst. So even post-resurrection, his body still matters. And they all touch him, he holds out his hand. And then Thomas, a week later, the same thing happens. Mm -hmm. This touching and uh, when they don't recognize him right away after he's walking in the garden and then he speaks their name and he recognizes, like it matters that he existed in a body. The road to Emmaus. How many of you remember this story or know a little bit about it? Mm -hmm. yeah they're heading out uh after all the events and yeah 
They're talking about everything that's happened and Jesus is walking with them. And there's something about that accompaniment and that revelation that happens along the way, but they still don't recognize him until he breaks the bread. And then they're like, <gasps> right? And we'll talk a little bit more about communion in a little bit and how that becomes the body of Christ for us. Uh, that first Corinthians passage, um, the spiritual gifts, the body of Christ, the body needs ears and eyes and feet and a nose and hands and feet. The body needs all of those parts in order to work. Is that a pretty familiar passage to some of you as well? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So all these, the body of Christ, that's an image that Paul uses in uh, Romans as well and Colossians a little bit. There's a little bit of that body of Christ imagery that it matters that there's a body. And then from the saints, and I'll ask, uh, so we'll look at Teresa of Avila for a really, and Martin Luther, and then we'll look at a Christian um, music song. Have uh, some of you may, it's attributed to Teresa of Avila. It's not known for sure that she said it, uh, but Christ has no body but yours, no hands, no feet on earth but yours. Yours are the eyes with which he looks with compassion on this world. Yours are the feet with which he walks. To do yours are the hands with which he blesses all the world. Yours are the hands. Yours are the feet. Yours are the eyes. You are his body. Christ has no body now but yours. No hands, no feet on earth but yours. Your eyes are with which he looks. Compassion on this world. Christ has no body on earth but yours. And who was Teresa of Avila? She was a saint that lived... Uh, not too far from the time of Luther, is it? Someone help me. She was a, she wrote a, a around the time of St. John of the Cross as well. And isn't, isn't she who Mother Teresa is named after? Well, there's a lot of Teresas, but yeah. yeah, probably. I mean, she had the, she was actually a very popular nun and that actually caused her some, um, some trouble. She was born in 1515. Uh -huh. She died in 1582. So Luther was born in 1483. And the Reformation happened in 1517. <clears throat> so she was just at the beginning of that. But that was a great time of Reformation in the Catholic Church, too. Things were changing. We don't often hear about that as Lutherans, but like eventually there was a whole counter Reformation movement that happened in the church. And I think the holy orders were a big part of that because that's where all the action was happening. I think Judy can correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> she, I, I'm remembering because I know she's somebody that I've read, but I couldn't remember all the details, but just a quick search. She did write a, a, a book called The Interior Castle, that's which so um, yes. which is all about sort of the inner spiritual life and and did a lot of work for some of the medieval mystics. A lot of them built on that work and it's a really a great book i was using it sort of as a personal reflection um sort of in a season of transition that i was in it's a really it's a really great book the interior castle um it's a little bit you have to it's very much it, it's very much sort of a mystical it sort of is it has imagery that that you know it feels a little bit dated maybe um but but the spiritual work that she draws to if you can sort of get past some of the imagery that may seem a little bit foreign the, the points that she's making are really really great well, and I think the holy orders in general, when you get down to uh, Benedictines, and I'm speaking without knowing, like I have not studied all the holy orders, but it seems like that is kind of where, you know, they, they build schools and colleges and universities and hospitals. And like, there's this deep thinking part of holy orders, but then they also do this work of embodying Christ for the world. So that was kind of the point of that is that there's this been this long movement toward capturing what it means to be the body of Christ in the world. So we'll look at some Martin Luther as well. And it has, for him, it has to do with um, the Holy Communion. But I think a lot of you have probably heard his idea about the priesthood of all believers Mm -hmm. It's not clear that he actually used that exact language, but the concept of it was this uh, no hierarchy between that we all have a calling. 
We all have vocation in our lives. Mm -hmm. um, but he didn't talk about it in exactly the same way. But communion, absolutely. We believe, teach, and confess that the Holy Supper, in the Holy Supper, the body and blood of Christ are truly and essentially present, truly distributed and received with the bread and the wine. And I don't know how you can say it any other way, but that if we receive the body of Christ into our body, <laughs> we are in a way becoming yeah. the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. but there's no way to avoid that. And I think that the way that I talk about it in worship, and I think most modern Lutheran pastors do uh, in the ELCA is that way, that it's we're becoming the body of Christ for the world. Mm -hmm. And he writes, uh, but of that bread and wine that are Christ's body and blood and that are accompanied by the word, these and no other, we say, are the treasure through which such forgiveness is obtained. So we believe that's where forgiveness happens. This treasure is conveyed and communicated to us in no other way than through the words given and shed for you. Here you have both, that it is Christ's body and blood and they are yours as a treasure and gift Christ's body cannot be an unfruitful, useless thing that does nothing and helps no one. For me, that took it to the next step. And this is all from Luther's large catechism. Um, this idea that Christ's body cannot be unfruitful. So what are your thoughts about being the body of Christ? Any reflections? We've gone through some Bible stuff. We've gone through a little of a mystic and Martin Luther thoughts about being the body of Christ. I, I kind of love that last line of Christ's body cannot be unfruitful, um, uh, cannot be an unfruitful, useless thing that does nothing and helps no one. Uh, it's, it's interesting um, that there's no distinction there between good fruit and bad fruit because you can bear bad fruit. Like there are very clear ways that the church in its past and even even Christians today are bearing bad fruit in the name of in the name of Christ. Um, and so it's interesting that like there's a reference to saying that Christ's body cannot be unfruitful. Um, but but and Luther's not really saying this, but but he doesn't say that all the fruit is good fruit necessarily. Um, and that's just where my mind went, because that's kind of the world that I live in but um but saying that like Christ's body is fruitful regardless of like just because of what it is it's going to be fruitful and then it's up to us to to acknowledge that and say okay are we going to bear good fruit or bad fruit yeah. um all right so let's uh let's sing a little song together see if you know this one <clears throat> just gonna go to the next and then we'll, I'll ask the question again in a different way. Have any of you heard this song? It's about different people coming into church and how they're received in the body. And this is the refrain, but if we are the body, why aren't his arms reaching? It's really a call to action. Why aren't his hands healing? Why aren't his words teaching? It's a convicting call for us. Why aren't his feet going? Why is his love not showing them there is the way? So he explores all these different people coming into church and are they received as, do we act like the body of Christ in the world? Mm -hmm. We can go to the next slide, please, Vicar. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what are some of the gifts of being part of the body of Christ and what are some of the challenges that you experience in this? Mm -hmm. I have to go let a dog in. I'll be right back, I can hear you. <laughs> <laughs> I think one of the biggest gifts for me of this particular um, take on things is the first time I read through the full catechism, this touched me and what it meant to me or what it said to me was, I need to be vigilant for God's presence in other people. Mm. Yeah. Because if, if it's there, I want to see it. Well, and the, Not, doesn't that also help you? It sort of, it creates empathy, right? It sort of helps you yeah. to connect yeah. with them and see them, even though, even if you don't agree, you know, on intellectual things or point for point, that, right. that creates a connection. It creates some sort of empathy and you see them as who they are 
even if yeah. you disagree about things. Yeah. That's why when we talk about our current problem here with anti-Semitism and all the chaos that's going on, um, what you want to do is find out what causes this in them. What is it in them? That, that's my first thought is why, why do they feel this way? Why are they so um, prone to believe these things? What, what is it about their life? And what am I supposed to do about it? Is there something I can do? Mm. Well, and I think that's part of, that speaks into the challenges of being part of the body of Christ. Yeah, yeah. You know, what is my reaction? Yeah. Right, within the body of Christ, there is a wide, wide, wide range of uh, conversations about things that are happening in the world right now uh, but always have been. And what does it mean that we're all in this together? What uh, holds us to account? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I think that's the first time that the fact that God is in each one of us, Jesus is in each one of us, that's the first time in my life that I recognize that fact. As, as being true and, and trying to live into it. Yeah, so wanting both to show forth Christ in the way that we live. Yeah. So called to see Christ in other people. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, it's challenging. So what are some other gifts of being part of the body of Christ? <laughs> Isn't it funny how the gift like fairly quickly turned into a challenge? <laughs> like it's just kind of right on that edge. Cause I, yeah. I don't know. I feel like, I feel like sort of like in each of us, we all have strengths and weaknesses and sometimes our strengths are our weaknesses and our weaknesses are our strengths. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's very similar in the church too. There's not, there's, it's kind of right on, right on the edge there. Um, yeah. Well, it's set up so that we can't do this alone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah well and i think too it's shared um shared uh opportunity to glorify god you know that we don't have to have all of the gifts that's a huge burden oh yeah yeah well and i, I think, think that's the gift that's what happens when we gather physically Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. worship space together is it becomes really clear like there's all these different gifts that are represented mm -hmm. yeah we're not well and even talking about you know one realistic experience of that is putting together the virtual choirs you know mm -hmm. if we were singing together the you know staggered breathing just happens because we aren't going to breathe when our neighbor breathes but when each person is recording their own, you don't know when everyone else is going to take that sneak breath. We just kind of have to trust that mm -hmm. not everyone's going to take that breath at the same time. Mm -hmm. So you could end up with a virtual choir with everyone going. <gasps> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Wouldn't that be something? <laughs> I don't want that to happen now. Funny. Yeah. Uh, so anyone but else? I think that, but I think part of that, you know, even though it's kind of a humorous example, like, I think that there's some, some truth in that for any time, like you have a gift, but there's, it's not the end. There's always more that can be added and, you know, shined through, well, I guess. To go back to our conversation about Jesus a couple of weeks ago and the idea that the fullness of who Jesus is, we need lots of different expressions. Oh, yeah. If the only church you had was ELCA Lutherans, you would not have an entire picture. Mm -hmm of right. who Jesus is. And um, so, I mean, that's both a gift and a challenge is that we're being pushed a little bit, you know, to really name who we are. I think we talked about that a little bit in uh, Bible study this morning in the story of the temptation and the 
when we're pushed is when we get clarity about who we are. Yeah. And I well, don't think those conversations are ever bad conversations to have. Well, and, and even in this class, I mean, you mentioned in the Jesus, the week that we focused on Jesus, but when we focused on baptisms too, I, I know, I mean, something that I sort of brought into all of that and something that I've been working through is figuring out, you know, how do we exist as, as part of the same sort of umbrella of Christians with this, with these various views on, on fundamental theology. And you, I mean, you, you said, well, each time there's been a split, it's created more opportunities for the expression of Jesus. It's helped the church to keep going. And that's a gift that the church has been able to continue to thrive and, and grow through those, through those um, separations and splits. But of course, it's also a challenge because it can create some division. Um, so it's hard. It's, yeah, it's sort of a both and sort of thing. I think one of the gifts that I've seen, you know, being part of the body of Christ is like, it's, it's, it's provided groundedness um, and I think <clears throat> there's a part of that just for me as an individual, sort of having a, a place to sort of ground myself, even if it hasn't been in a particular church or in a particular denomination, but just knowing the truth of the gospel, that's, that's, that's been a great sense of sort of grounding groundedness. Um, and I, I think that's, that's something that I can consider sort of purely a gift of being part of the body of Christ. There's a lot of things that are both. There's a lot of things that are challenges. That's the thing that for me, I think is probably the purest gift that I can think of at the moment of being part of the body of Christ is that sense of who Jesus is, who I am in him and, and knowing that and owning that as, as my identity. Um, All right. So we talked a little bit about what it means to be the body of Christ, but now let's talk about that word virtual a little bit. I love watching the screen move, right? What does it mean to be virtual? So you can actually go to the next screen. So here's a whole bunch of definitions of virtual. I know they're teeny tiny. Yeah. We're gonna yeah. try to figure out yeah. we're try to figure out which definition. So being such in essence or effect, though not formally recognized or admitted, like a virtual dictator, in okay. essence or effect, though not formally recognized. Okay, oh. that's probably not it. Well, it could be kind of worship that's not exactly being on or simulated on a computer, network print or virtual books, virtual keyboards. Oh, there we go, being simulated on a computer. So we're kind of trying mm -hmm. to do worship on a computer. Mm -hmm. uh, occurring or existing primarily online, that's it, virtual mm -hmm. shopping, <laughs> of relating to or existing within a virtual reality, of relating to or using virtual memory, of relating to or being a hypothetical particle whose existence is inferred from indirect evidence. Wow. <laughs> I think we're going to go with being on or simulated on a computer occurring primarily online. So that's mm -hmm. our definition of virtual. Because mm -hmm. I've, I've said one of the things that I find frustrating is like, we're real, we're still real. Um, yeah. Like yeah. everything's being communicated through this form, but we're real, mm -hmm. we're not virtual people, we're real people. And we're actually there on Sunday morning and we make mistakes just so you know how real we are. <laughs> <laughs> No Android will be, or what are they called? I mean, AI. Yeah, there's no AI going on there. <laughs> I am not a robot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, not a robot. Thanks for persuading us of that, Rick or Amber. <laughs> it's interesting thinking about this in the context of uh, like so much of what we see like on social media and so much of our online discourse are things we would never say to somebody directly to their face. But because there's that barrier, there's, there's more, we sort of feel like, oh, that's not a real person. I can say whatever I want. Yeah. But you just said it, Pastor Trudy. No, like we're people. Like talk to us like we're people because we're people. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. And, the, um, and the effects of things that happen are that real too, right? So if you virtual insult hurt, 
as much as an insult said to your face. Yeah. Maybe yeah. even more because yeah. you might be sitting alone and hearing it where if it happened in a public space or in some kind of a conversation, you might be able to deal with it differently. Mm -hmm. So the realness of the effects of virtual stuff. And I think there's a connecting point to what we do as a church there too. I would say, I think the morning Bible study group has gotten closer and deeper being on Zoom. Yeah, I think you're right. I don't know how it happened. I don't know. Would you agree to that, Judy? What does Judy say? Judy has to unmute first. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I think there is. I mean, research has shown that in a virtual setting, you're more open and you say things that you wouldn't so much face to face. But I think also it breeds a familiarity and a safeness and a closeness within the group. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I think there's also a, cause I also played, I played um, like bar trivia online now too. Um, and, and I've noticed just in the small group of our team, seeing everybody's faces is much more sort of intimate than sitting around a table in public. Cause things are going on, there's distractions, stuff is happening out here. You know, you're maybe talking to the person across from you but you can't hear what's going on on the other end of the table. Um, I mean, there are moments of a lot of noise and people kind of cross talking, but for the most part, you're seeing and hearing people in much more, in a much greater sense of intimacy than you would um, in sort of a public setting when, when there are other distractions and things going on. So I think there is a benefit for sure. Well, and this, that. Group, is, this group is even kind of gelling into, it's kind of, a predictable group now, you know, and we're seeing each other every week and we can, re we have a common uh, language. We've learned some things together. So yeah. I think that that's really good too. Um, so someone did a riff, uh, Vicar, you can forward the slide, advance the slide. So uh, a social media strategist did this. Christ has no online presence, but yours, no blog, no Facebook page, but yours, yours are the treat tweets through which love touches this world yours are the posts through which the gospel is shared yours are the updates through which hope is revealed christ has no online presence but yours no blog no facebook page but yours huh. <laughs> wow that's that's fun that's a good that's a good connection that's good And for those of us, and I'm 10 years out of office work, so <laughs> my knowledge stopped 10 years ago. But, but for those of us who never got to this spot, and I know so many of those uh, folks, those are the ones that I heard for right now. Those among our own people who, who don't have knowledge of technology and can't use it are missing out on this. Yeah. 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 And that's always going to be a challenge. But I think yeah. to do this little twist on it that so some of the challenges with it, um, but the gifts, uh, this is what we have right now. And so the gifts of being able, that intimacy that's able to be built sometimes in Bible study, some people have said they've have felt that in worship as well. Mm -hmm. They feel like they're being talked to yep. um, in a much more personal way. Well, you don't you have no distraction of anyone around you. Well, for me, I'm alone, so I don't have my family around. It's kind of a, yeah, um, a much more, it feels like more of a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's something we were talking about looking ahead to Lent, as Vicar Amber and I said, could we be in a different place where it's more like we're talking to you rather than, but now we can have people in person and it's like, oh, seriously, as soon as we get a new plan, yeah. <laughs> yeah. that wouldn't be fun for anyone to have us sit and just talk to a camera, right? 
Yeah. That's one of the challenges uh, by having people at uh, live stream, by the way, is like, do you look at the people or do you look at the camera? But you're making someone feel excluded. It's hard. It's challenging. Yeah. So. Yeah, I think with the virtual too, you tend to listen a little more closely because of the one-on-one -on -one and the fact that you can go back and, you know, hear it again. I think that helps mm -hmm. the clarification and the learning and the... That's so true. You know, yeah. I've, I've definitely done that on Sunday mornings, just yeah, to right be too. like, okay, oh, okay, all right, I'm, I'm tracking. Whereas in person, I might, you know, I might not catch myself if my mind is wandering or something. So there's... Definitely, I've, I've experienced that as well. So I think we could probably gather together to sing, but we'll do the sermons online. <laughs> you can listen, <laughs> just have us come in and sing. <laughs> <laughs> just you and me, we're gonna have a little conversation. <laughs> because I felt like, you know, when I told the story a couple weeks ago, that little piece of gospel, it actually, I felt like it worked better in this than it did on Sunday morning. Yeah. Huh. Mm -hmm. I'm Maybe sorry, the, the piece of, you said the when piece I, of when God's I, When story? I told the story uh, of the, um, the disciples, Fisher's yeah. Son, when I told oh, you mean, mm -hmm. right, when I told it in Zoom, oh. it actually felt like it landed differently than when I told it on Sunday morning. Sure. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, it was very powerful when you did it in this group. Um, so, I, I'm, I'm really glad you did that. And do you think part of that is because you are, we're seeing each other here. You know, when you're preaching from church, you're talking into, into a camera. Well, and I think we had also just spent the last hour really sort of looking at Jesus and looking at sort of the history, sort of from a very analytical point of view. And we, we've really been sort of, um, you know, intellectually thinking about it, but then just hearing it preached sort of was that emotional connection and that sort of bringing it back to, okay, what's the heart of our faith about? I think that was a part of it too, for at least for me. Yeah, absolutely. But so I think- it's, We don't have time, but we don't have time to do that on a Sunday morning. <laughs> right, but I think it's important to name that that's a gift, right? That yeah. there are some things that actually are better in this kind of format. And no. we'll have to, we have to think about that very carefully. Uh, Not only for us, I think we're we're drawing folks who don't always go to church. Hmm. Yeah, and, and and aren't Lutherans either. Yeah, right. I mean, like lots of people. Right, yeah. we can share it much more broadly. All right, let's uh -huh. go on to the next slide. Let's. So this idea of virtual community, um, that one of the gifts uh, is that it kind of transcends any particular moment. So one of the gifts I think that we talked about earlier of being in person in the body of Christ is this sense of all being there together, but there's a different sense of togetherness in a virtual community this idea of what makes us community. We believe that when we gather ever on a Sunday morning, that it's not just us gathered at Geneva Lutheran. We believe we're gathered with people around the world. We believe we're gathered with saints who went before us. We believe we're gathered with saints who came after us. They are all there. So like people we don't even know, we haven't even thought of yet are there with us. People we've only heard stories about, they're there with us and people all around the world. That's a really powerful idea. And I think we can experience that in a different way virtually because when we're talking about, I don't say good morning anymore. I say hello. Say hello. <laughs> hello. <laughs> Well, because it could be midnight. Who would know? Exactly. It was like I had this moment of like, and even, um, you know, when things aren't going well and we start like five minutes late, I thought even, you know, most of the people aren't watching live. Mm -hmm. And so to speak too directly to just the people that are watching live, I had this like aha moment mm -hmm. that 
we kind of have to live in Kairos time when we think about it as this isn't in any particular moment. So people are experiencing it at all different moments and there's something really powerful about that. So that next, uh, these quotes from Deanna Thompson who wrote a book about the virtual body of Christ. And I'll tell you a little bit about her story in a second. But she says the virtual body of Christ, a body that is wedded to, but also transcends specific individual incarnations of church. So the virtual body of Christ, her argument is that the body of Christ has always been virtual. Mm -hmm. It's not just, oh, there's a pandemic. In fact, her book was written before the pandemic. Mm, interesting. Ah. So her argument was the body of Christ has always been virtual because it transcends time and space. She talks about the recitation of the creeds is one tangible way members of the body of Christ experience connection to that vast virtual body of Christ. One that connects us not just to other Christians around the world in the present, but to all previous incarnations of the body of Christ in the 2000 year history of the church. Yep. Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Digging, digging, yeah. digging really deep. Mm -hmm. Great. And that's not something that we often think about when we're so like, let's, you know, pre pandemic times, we're going about our routines, you know, we're doing our jobs, we're picking up our kids from school, we're going to church, because it's what we do. It's part of our routine, we're checking it off. And just because of how busy our lives are, we, we miss that we don't think about that all the time, because we only can sort of picture and imagine and sort of um, experience what's right in front of us, which I think actually, I mean, Pastor Trudy, you do a great job of this, of, of reminding us in worship that we're connected to the saints that came before and, the, you know, the saints that will come after and there's a world outside of Geneva Lutheran. You do a very, very good job of that. But I think, I think a lot for a lot of people, it is just because of how busy and, and, and packed their lives are, um, don't always think about that all the time in this kind of way. But, but I think, but I think by going virtual, it has been a very, it's been a much more sort of tangible il illustration of this concept. Yeah. So when else have you experienced this? Um, that should be due. When else do we experience this larger sense of church? Mm. So she's going so far beyond, mm -hmm. like, when do you experience church is more than just the people gathered? Because that's virtual. That's a virtual body of Christ when you experience something that you can't see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that's often, uh, often a time during communion to, to mm -hmm. feel your loved ones present, uh, those who are gone before you. Um, and it's a time when they, they come to my mind. And I think it's just that sense that I'm receiving the body of Christ here and they are with him. Hmm. Well, and we even have things, so communion absolutely is one of those times that's built into mm -hmm. uh, almost every in-person worship service. But then mm -hmm. uh, we have actual holidays, you know, the uh, All Saints, that's right. all about mm -hmm. calling attention to the fact that this is something. Mm -hmm. I would say funerals are a place when we really talk about, Yeah so much more than just this yeah. moment well and i think you know depend some hymns you know i can hear my grandpa singing mm -hmm. and i think about yeah. you know texts where mm -hmm. you know you can imagine that like the one that really strikes for me is oh god our help in ages past and that that was a hymn that has been sung for generations and finding strength and God in all of it. So that's definitely one for you, me is. You, you, know, you, know, you know what him does that for me, Amy, is uh, a mighty fortress is our God. Like that just feels like it's from mm -hmm. such a different time, but yeah. it's still, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the ideas in it are still, are still resonant. Um, I, was, sure. I, was, I was thinking of music too, um, because it connects us with hymns that are, 200 300 400 500 years old mm -hmm. um scripture because scripture you know we is 2000 years old that's mm -hmm. for me and always and i always have to put on a different way of thinking when i'm listening to scripture because 
I have to remember, okay, this is not, this was not written for my context. This was written in a different context with a different cultural, you know, set of sort of cultural norms. And what is, what does that mean for that community? And then what does that mean for me? And I think Pastor Trudy and Amy and, and Vicar Amber, you all do a really great job of making those connections for us. But that is another point where um, I'm reminded of, of sort of how much bigger this story is than just my immediate, what's going on in my world and what's going on even in the world of, of, of GLC. So let me tell you a little bit about Deanna Thompson and why she was so passionate about writing this book before a pandemic. She uh, is, um, she uh, had a debilitating form of cancer and was excluded and became so aware of how important the body of Christ, but she could not worship with people. And I know Amy has had that experience as well. Carol has had that experience mm -hmm. where without, there was no online church to go to except for, you know, Joel Osteen or whatever. <laughs> the Crystal Cathedral. Yeah, or Crystal yeah. Cathedral, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's like to, there's a whole group of people now that are being seen and acknowledge that weren't before. Yeah, I don't think we're going to be able to give it all up. I think we may want to continue to, to, to record our worship services. Yeah. Oh, we're never going to stop. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, this is a forever thing. We'll yeah. continue yeah. to post worship services. I, I mean, I think continuing to do um, some of the Facebook meditations, I think doing some classes on Zoom is probably still going to happen. How do you all feel about that? Oh, I, yeah. love I love great it. About that. Yeah. It, it, Barb, how do you feel about it? Well, are you talking about we're still going to have in person as well? Yeah, of course. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, I think that's a good idea if it's feasible. Well, yeah. for anyone who's who's handicapped in any way or as old as I am, and I don't like going out in weather like this. Right. Um, yeah. Well, so I, we will never have to make a decision about canceling church on a Sunday morning again because of weather. Yeah. <laughs> We will That's never true. have to do it, right? That is true. You, you might you might have to make a decision about who preaches depending on how snowed in people get, but. <laughs> I have cross country skis. Yeah. I was just gonna say that. <laughs> I think I did walk to Geneva Lutheran one time when it was pretty deep snow. I can't remember for sure, but I feel like I did. I can only remember once since I, been there now that's what five years now yeah so i mean i think that that's going to be uh really wonderful to know that and even a thursday evening bible study um to do it on zoom is i think mm -hmm. it's a mm -hmm. thing to be able to do absolutely I, I would love that i i do you ever um so, so, but it, to, to Barb's sort of point, like it can't also, it can't completely take the place of the in-person. So sort of what's, you know, it kind of sounded like we started to brainstorm a balance. So you were saying, well, we'll just do the singing in person, but then everything, and I know that that was a joke, but what's, but what's sort of the, how do you get some of both where you get sort of the intimacy of a virtual experience, but then you do also experience physical presence? Um, and, and you said one way is communion, but the physical presence of other people and singing together and just the joy that comes with in-person community. Um, you know, how, how do we, yeah, what's sort of the balance there? Yeah, I, I, I don't know what it'll, I don't know exactly what it will look like. Yeah. yeah. Um, but we'll see. But yeah, of course we'll be back in person at some point, but it's a long time if you think about the thing before, we'll be able to sing together. Mm. Yeah. So um, even though we're able to gather, like that's still a huge part that's missing. Yeah, definitely. 
Um, I, you know what? One thing that just came to mind, like being there for a baptism, being there and watching a baptism yes. in person yeah. is, is something that I really miss. Yeah. Um, we can yeah. see the pictures. We can do the, we can do the, the liturgy sort of after the fact, but being there in person is so powerful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. And, uh, yeah. First communions, those, I just love them. Well, this way, I mean, we've got lots of pictures. Um, we're going to have, I think, how many First Communions do we have this weekend? Because <laughs> we have to divide them all up. 17? Is it 20? Oh, wow. I think there's, there's 17 kids, uh, 15 families. But because they changed the mitigations, we could group a couple of them together. So at least they get that sense of community. Yeah, like good. a lot of pictures and stuff that are going to be shared in next weekends yeah yeah but yeah it's what we have and and i think if one of the biggest gifts we've gotten out of all of this is is understanding just how we treasure being together and being able to normally have the opportunity to do either to either remain at home and see it or or be able to be there yeah, and I think, um, I was not kidding, I don't know, a bunch of weeks ago in worship, I don't even remember what the context was, but I mean, I said, doing what we do one time is harder than doing what we used to do three times. Yeah. <laughs> like, if anyone's like, oh, they're taking it so easy over at church, I don't think anyone thinks yeah. that, you know, I think most people <laughs> no, understand no. it, like, like no, this is not easier. That. I think that um, it has to be so much harder for all of you who who are in church doing the recordings or doing live and then you're doing all of this visits on all of these teachings online and it, it's probably triple the work it, that yeah before. it's possible that if we were trained in a totally different way but yes we would love to go back to the way things were but now we've learned some things that will allow us to I think reach more people and maybe even in a better way. What do you mean if you were trained in a different way? Is that what you said? Trained like in your schooling? Yeah, I mean we're trained to like be in contact with people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, Amy's trained to lead a choir, you know, where they're yeah. front of her, right? You know, not like but maybe there's a possibility uh, of <laughs> a different way of training where you just do this, right? Mm. But that's not us. Right, right, yeah. right. Amy yeah. will tell us on Wednesday nights with our virtual choir that we all sound so good. And of course, nobody can hear each other. <laughs> nobody can hear anything <laughs> but yourself. Yeah. It was uh, void up. Yeah. So you can end the PowerPoint or you can stop share. <laughs> there we can see each other again look at that there we go so oh. what are some concluding thoughts so i think we've uh i think we've covered the gifts and the challenges what it means to be the body of christ and what it means to be a virtual body of christ um the things we've learned that are helpful about it and the things that we've learned that are challenging about it so would anyone like to share any thoughts? What's working on? What's working in you? What things are standing out to you? Well, I like both personally. Um, you did a first communion video about the church and your vestments and all that kind of stuff. And I really enjoyed that. It was informative to me. And <laughs> I'm sure that's nothing that I would have come upon had YouTube not been, you know, so popular there. Yeah, shout out to the altar pyramids vestments. Um, <laughs> it's up on our YouTube channel under the learning. Yeah. Oh, really? I oh, you created a new section for it? I need to check oh that out. God. That's awesome. Actually, these are in that section too, but oh, cool. I snap my fingers and you can, like, anyway, it's hilarious. It's there really was... cute, but yeah, you'll learn about how we set up the altar and stuff like that and um, some of the pyramids. You know yeah. what's funny is, is, you know, because I remember learning all that stuff too when I was in confirmation, but 
you, you know, it's good to have a refresher every once in a while. So having those videos there to sort of come back and come to, you know, at your choice when you have time is really, really great. It's a great resource. And, and had that not been, been, been the way it was, I wouldn't have thought to look that up. I would have, yeah. I don't know what I would have thought, but the fact that it's there is great, you know? Yeah. Other things that you're, other things that you're kind of holding on to and milling around. I think that it's, sorry, it's important to like keep in mind who you don't see, yeah. you know, like the virtual presence is like, there's always someone missing from the physical space and who is that and how do you reach them? You know, cause it's not that it's, it might not even be that they don't want to be a part of absolutely the church, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that was, so thanks for making that point a little bit firmer. I mean, that was Deanna Thompson's whole point in writing it. It's like, don't forget yeah. um, about people. But she argues, you know, the church, it's always been a virtual body. I have to get a dog in again. I can still hear you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh. Victor, are you and Pastor doing any... Um, home visits via zoom are you doing them in person as you can as you're able yeah the home visits have been either phone call or or like visiting them in their house um masked and distanced yeah, yeah. well and i have been able to go to the hospital and um things like mm -hmm. that too i i'm curious just from I, I guess this is more just an informational curiosity, but like how how closely are you able to like see your analytics? Like when you look at on YouTube, when you look at like a service posting, you can see how many people are watching at the time and then you can see what the total number of views are. So you can see how many people watch later, but are you able to go in and see where they're watching from or like how far reaching are, are you? you are we can't you able see to... where they're watching from necessarily, but we can see how much of the service they watch. Oh. <laughs> oh, oh gosh, I never thought oh. of it. Oh. <laughs> Every time you don't stick around for the post lewd, we know. Let's uh, just say okay, so how does that come up? Is it just the person's IP address that says this this no. person? No, it doesn't. It it gloms it all together and it says the average watch time. Oh. Mm -hmm. Well, so then you're like, well, I know some people are watching the whole thing. That means there's some people that are watching like three minutes. Like, no, not for me. <laughs> or, they're, or they're just fast forwarding to the sermon and watching that 10 minutes or whatever. <laughs> yeah. yeah, anyway, sometimes, yeah. So we can see uh, things like that, but not where people are. Yeah. But we yeah. know, like, I know my parents watch every week on their iPhone. Their first, uh -huh. their first piece of technology. And they got it. Well, this is all they have. Cool. They have an iPhone. They don't have a computer. No. Wow. I've never laid hands on a computer, an iPad. So they just have an iPhone. So they sit around it and watch. Wow. And Which they're is... like, we talk, we talk about it every week. I bet. And we have opinions about your hair. <laughs> <laughs> Parents will always be parents. Yeah. Yes. Well, I'm like, I know that dad prefers me to wear my hair curly because I got my curly hair from him. So yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> anyway, other thoughts. Sorry about that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, so you got any you got any opinions on the sermon or <laughs> or yeah. the or the message or <laughs> well, no, there was one week that she wasn't a huge fan, let's just say. Okay. Or she took it in a different direction. Um, so then she made a point like after that to be like, you're doing a really good job. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's okay, mom. Everyone's not going to like the sermons every week. And I think that you need to, uh, you know, I mean, especially if they land sometimes, they land with me and, um, you know, you just have to struggle through it. Right. Is your folks home church do they have youtube do they watch that one as well yeah well and that was another thing my mom said one time i she's like well you know we have professionals <laughs> we have professionals now a lot of other people say to us that ours is very professional yeah. you know so it's kind of like 
Because <laughs> there's still people doing, uh, still pastors doing sermons from their bunkers, you know. Yeah. yeah. Um, but or, or 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 not doing them at all, and right. they just don't meet. Yeah. But I just thought that was funny that she was like, "I was done by professional." <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, it's all it's all it's all relative, right? It's all based on <laughs> oh, what gosh, you've experienced. I, hope I don't do this with my kids. Where like everything is unintentionally an insult. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear all right are there any final thoughts i have a story to show you just how long the body of christ has been virtual or there has been virtual you excited about that yeah sure let's see the story anyone else have a final thought on virtual body of christ it actually happens, uh, it's the part of the gospel story for this weekend. Uh, Jesus comes to a town called Capernaum, and there's a slave there who belongs to some centurion, and he's in a bad way. In fact, he's about to die. And he's very valuable to the centurion. And here's about Jesus, he sends some elders of the Jews to go and speak on his behalf. And they come to Jesus and they say, it is worthy that you to him should grant this. He loves our people. The synagogue, he built it for us. Jesus started on his way walking with them. But while they were still some distance from the house, some friends of the centurion came to speak on his behalf. They said, Lord, I am not worthy to have you come under the roof of my house, nor am I worthy to come to you, but only speak the word and my servant will be healed. For I am a man set under authority and I have soldiers under me. I say to one, come, and he comes. To another, go, and he goes. To another, do this, and he does it. Jesus was amazed. He said, not even in Israel have I seen such faith. And when the friends returned to the home, they found the servant healthy. That is the gospel of the Lord. One of my favorites. Yeah. Hear the virtual part of it? Yeah. Yes. Yep. That's clearly. Mm -hmm. Didn't need to be touching. Yep. And if you're watchful, you'll experience it yourself. Mm. So uh, one of the things that uh, Vicar <laughs> Amber has done in a couple of other meetings, and I'll ask her to do it again, is to do uh, to close with a blessing mm. where uh, so if we believe that if Jesus could heal the servant at a distance, that we believe that there are connections, real connections between us, even though we aren't in the same space, that we also are able to bless each other. So uh, would you mind, Vicar Amber, leading us in a blessing? Sure. And um, something that I think is on wherever your camera is, mine's on the top of my computer. If you want to like take a hand and just reach it out and rest it like above your camera, above on your camera, imagine that, that your hand is reaching out and touching the shoulder of another person that's on the screen or every other person that's on the screen besides you. But we're all blessing each other in this moment because the words that I'm going to speak come from scripture. So receive this blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine on you with grace and with mercy. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. 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 All right.
Thank you all for your patience tonight and for your contributions and most of all for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Thank very you. much. Would, would, you be able, would you be able to send, I know last week you did send the prayers by email. Um, the ones that like the Teresa of Avila, the Luther, the, the, the twist on Teresa that some of those things that were in the slides there, would you be able to send those out? Those I'll send those? the whole PowerPoint, Pastor Judy. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll do it. That's Just what I write. Yes, yeah, I'll send that PowerPoint to you. All Perfect. right, thanks all. Thank, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. You. Thank you. Stay warm and Good cozy. Night. We will. <laughs> and there you can put the uh, recording in the Google Drive. Cool. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Thank you, thank you, thank you.